one second. <laughs> Welcome to the Quarantine Diaries. You're with Marie here from Skeynes. Today is Happy Star Wars Day. May the 4th be with you, Kurt. Day 40 of quarantine and lockdown. So I have Kurt Payne with me and it has been great because I've been wanting to get you on for several weeks now and it's so good to finally have you here. You've been very active in chat with a number of people, so it's good to have you aboard. And isn't it typical? We've been chatting away just perfectly before going live and now everything freezes up just as we want to go and do it. Hi, good morning everybody. And now with any luck, this is going to come good um, as I am chatting to Kurt. If anyone has any questions for Kurt, particularly around machine knitting, do, there he is, um, do fire those in the comments for us as well. He's going to, definitely going to be talking about some of those. Are you back with us, my friend? There we go. I can hear you now. It's actually frozen. Yeah. Oh, there we go. You jump yourself out. And, anyway, he's going to jump back in, everyone, and then we'll see how we get on. How is everybody this morning? Hey, Charles. Is, ah, yeah, you managed to make it, so hopefully we'll get him back. And uh, Barbara has jumped in this morning for chat. Barbara, I just want to thank you for those recipes. They were fantastic. I actually, um, yeah, Barbara sent me um, the most fantastic. I think it was from the mainland cheese site, wasn't it, Barbara? But um, a cheese roll, South London cheese roll recipe. So um, I've got a funny feeling that I've said to my husband if he can manage to get um, sandwich white bread. He's out at work actually for a couple of hours this morning. I'm, I'm just, I think that could be lunch for us today. Uh, so that is really, really good. So with any luck, Kurt will be able to jump in again in the minute. But while, until he's doing that, I will fill you on a couple of other things while I'm here. One, uh, with the Skein Speakeasy, I have uh, got Claire hunting out and doing the, running the randomizer. There's my dog. I'm going to leave him there for a minute. Um, the randomizer over the April and May, and she's going to be uh, getting those winners for us. So I will probably be announcing those. Um, I'll definitely announce them on the show tomorrow, but probably put them in the feeds. And then we've also got, um, for this month, I'm going to keep binge knit going because, I mean, essentially we are going to be in uh, lockdown. So we've still got an, a, another week to go. Uh, so we may as well keep things going there for another week. So and everyone sort of is in the middle of really binging into stuff at the moment and really getting some really good heady projects uh, tr trucking along. So it'll be so good to actually see those. Uh, so that is good. What else have I got on my list to talk to you guys about this morning? Um, oh, Rambler. Just hopefully while Kurt is minute, hopefully he's able to get back. So with the Rambler, I'll just check that he is not trying to contact me on the other things. Oh, there we go. He's just going to try another device and see how he gets on. Right, I'm just going to show you my Rambler while he's doing that. So there's my progress there. As you can see, I am tracking along really well. As you can see, it's growing. It's probably grown another good couple of inches since I showed you yesterday. Um, and I am. I'm really, really tracking along with that. And uh, I'm going to have another good lash it again today. What I'm going to do with this, I've actually made a decision about how I'm going to finish off that hem. And what I think I'm going to do is I'm going to work down until I get to the length that I want. And I'm actually going to do a folded hem. So if you've ever done one of those, a folded hem is great because it's a way of actually weighting down either a sweater or a garment so it doesn't roll. But it actually is also, it just sort of like blends everything out. Because all the activity and the highlights of the sweater are at the top and the yoke, I don't want anything at the bottom of the tunic to actually take away from what is supposed to be the, the height and the eye line, which is up here. So I'm going to um, do a folded hem where I'll knit down to the length that I want. And because I'm in stocking stitch, I will then put in a row of garter stitch. So uh, because I'm working in the round, I'll jump to uh, pearl, a pearl row. I'll do a pearl round rather. And I'll do a pearl round. And then I will continue and do a series of uh, stocking stitch again and I'll probably do it at around sort of about five centimeters a good a, quite a goodly amount and what that round of garter stitch will do is it actually gives you a fold line 
and it means that I can fold that back and then I just do a whip stitch across the inside of that edge. So then I end up having a hem where it's folded over but it's quite weighted uh, because you've got a double layer of fabric and it won't roll up. So you won't get any of that stocking stitch rolling if I'd just done straight stocking stitch and then just cast it off. So it allows you to have a very, very gender sort of um, clean finished edge. And because it's quite weighty across the bottom, um, it will sit quite well and, and hopefully sit very, very flat. I've done um, this hem before in a couple of other garments that I've done. In fact, I actually should have done the block, colour block cardigan that you've seen me wear, the grey and yellow one. That's actually got that... Um, folded hem in it and I, it's actually one that I really really like and it makes a garment sit very flat and it's got a really really clean finish so that is how I'm going to finish that off. I toyed with the idea of maybe doing some ribbing on some bigger needles or double ribbing or some twisted rib but then I thought no you know what I'm going to keep it simple stupid and just have it looking really crisp and clean um, so we'll just see how Kurt's getting on Right, he's just going to say, well, I'll keep talking, shall I? So how is everybody else um, going today? Let's see how everyone is tracking in this morning. Um, great, Suzanne, awesome. She's already throwing some questions in there for when we get Kurt back. Um, oh, there we go. Charles is just saying, why not pick up the stitches and then do a three-needle bind-off? That's really, really clean. Actually, yeah, Charles, I could probably do that, to be honest. The only reason, yeah, I probably could. I mean, the only thing that I uh, would not necessarily do is that it is a sport weight yarn so I just it might pull a little bit but um, actually I might try that because I mean if I don't like it I'll just undo it. It doesn't really worry me particularly much um, but that's what I'm that's where I'm at at the minute. I haven't um, and then I've been really monogamous. I really want to get this finished. I'm quite determined to get this finished. So I haven't started anything else. I am still quite determined, though, to get that cow that I was talking about done. Um, so I am going to have a look at that. And I am having a look at um, also, obviously, I want to get gold wing up and running as well. So that's what I'm looking at there. Uh, we also had a production meeting at the mill this morning, which was great. And we talked about um, some of the yarns that are coming through. So they're working on a list, which I will probably get in the next day or two for the next tranche of yarns coming through. But a priority has been put on um, both Merino Soft and Perindale. And from that meeting, I can let you know that we'll be looking at uh, Perindale um, in sort of good amounts will start coming through from about the 12th to the 23rd of this month. Um, and Merino Soft so heading towards the end of May. Both of those are actually yarns that we have to have in production. We've run out of uh, base stock, so they're literally working their way through the mill at the minute. So that is great news. So if you're after both Perindale or Merino Soft, those will be coming in very soon as well. So that's very, very good. Um, the other thing I'm gonna, that we've got coming up too is uh, we have got our 10 year anniversary coming up. That is um, actually at the end of the week. So. I'm just working on some stuff that we might be able to do for the remainder of May to celebrate that. So that's, and it's just really difficult because we had all these plans <laughs> that we we're going to do for the anniversary. And of course, the pandemic has gone and literally tossed all those ideas out the window. Like we were going to have everybody, we we're going to have a big prize where people could actually come to Cannes and we we're going to fly them here. And we we're going to do all this stuff. Yeah, can't do anything. <laughs> can't do any of that now. So we're just sort of working on some plan Bs with those at the minute. So do be patient with us with, with that. So that's some, um, this should be some fun stuff that we're looking at doing. <coughs> what else have we got on the board, Miss Ford? Uh, oh, actually, the other thing too, I just popped up before on social media. Um, happy birthday to our Ethan. Ethan uh, from Outlaw Yarn. It's his birthday today. Um, it is a zero birthday today. One. Happy birthday, Ethan, um, from all of us at Skeins. It's a really good day for you. What a great day to have it on, May the 4th. It's awesome. So happy birthday for you on that. I'll just have a couple of this before I start choking again. Let's see how we go. Oh. Um, 
we'll see how that oh no nothing right, i'll keep talking shall i i'll keep talking um oh another beautiful scarf jewel says thank you uh this is called knit all my love from martina beam as you know i'm a huge martina beam fan um i didn't actually knit this one uh one of uh, the ladies in my knit group she knit it for us as a sample for the shop but i just love it and it goes so well with um all of these bits and pieces it is just absolutely fantastic really enjoying that um and i've seen uh, some really wonderful projects in the speakeasy there's some really beautiful stuff going on at the moment i've, I've seen a couple of jennifer steingast's um projects roaming around which has been really really lovely and lots of bits and pieces being finished which is great so oh here we go here's kurt he's back there he oh there he is hi there he is! Yay! Oh, I've had some it, it took Twelve on. minutes to like reload a router and then like download the app onto my phone and then you know it'll all be going. <laughs> it's all right. That's technology, though, isn't it? Yeah. You know, technology. It's all right. It's all right. They they had to, they had to listen to me. I managed to get all my housekeeping stuff out of the way while you were doing that, so that was good. So we can actually get on and talk about really interesting stuff now. Um. I'm really delighted to have Kurt here. Kurt um, is obviously, has been in the chat with us during the Quarantine Diaries quite a bit, but also one of the neat things is we've been talking about a lot across Quarantine Diaries is the Quarantarium hat, which you have done uh, as a design, a mystery knit along with Outlaw Yarns, and that was rampantly successful. Everybody loved it, and the hats just looked incredible. I mean, the design was stunningly beautiful. Oh, thanks. But it actually really blew my mind. Like, you know, I was actually, I was in Melbourne and I had the choice to either race back to New Zealand early and then have some free time before lockdown or stay in Australia or come back as planned and go into quarantine. And then, so I'm now in day 50 of quarantine. So it's crazy. But um, at the same time, um, Anna and Carlos were doing their knit along. I thought, oh, that looks fun. And... So I just put it out there into the yarn layer, you know, would anyone be interested in a little knit along? And, you know, a few people said yes. And, you know, three people say yes to something. For me, that's, you know, we'll do it. And so I um, quickly designed this thing. I actually haven't knit that hat yet because I don't have yarn and we weren't able to buy yarn. But just on the computer software, like I already had a block and then I just applied some... Um, motifs a lot of them were from older machine knitting magazines um, that i had collected um, applied it to the block chopped it up into the pieces for the knit along and then um, pretty much published it so it was like not much work a base and a yarn i knew no, i love it oh it wasn't much work it was so easy <laughs> yeah <laughs> so it's the, the kind of thing you know i can do you know a few designs a day yeah like that yeah um but then um, so it was really popular in the knit along. Like it was so exciting seeing what yarns people had put together. Mm. And then Makers Mercantile in the USA picked it up to do a special selling the yarn with the pattern. So I had to put it on Ravelry, which I, is something I don't usually do. But people wanted to add it as um, projects as well. So that was really cool. And then um, New Zealand Fabrics and Yarns has picked it up as a buy some yarn, get the free pattern as well. So awesome. it's really exciting. But what was probably most exciting about that was people who haven't done much color work. They're like, here's a little project. We have the time. And they actually tried and experimented and mm. experimented with colors. So it was, you know, it's been a really cool time. But a lot of people have asked, like, where the inspirations for that mm. um, hat have come from. So it has a name, Quarantarium, which for me is combining the quarantine with um, terrarium. So, you know, you get a... A, a glass, of, you know, a glass yeah. bowl. Yeah, you put or plants cave. and stuff in you it. You put plants and you put random rocks and you put um, crystals and shells or whatever displayed in there. And um, a good friend of mine, Ali, has, um, he has a YouTube channel and he has an Instagram page, um, uh, Elia Design. So he's based in Turkey. He's actually, I think he was born in Iran. And so he's Middle Eastern, his videos are all in um, Arabic. And he's the complete polar opposite of me, whereas I'm very technically minded. He'll just throw stuff together. And 
um, if you go to his YouTube page and you look at um, one of his most recent videos is meditation, you'll look around some of the still lifes that he sets up with plants and random stuff he picks up at flea markets, and you'll get an idea of how I collated the motifs into the Quarantarium hat. So really exciting. Yeah, and I loved the um, f like for me. What I mean, what I adored with that hat was the the very Art Deco sort of motifs in it. So I mean, coming from Napier, that was yeah. something really, really comforting for me. Um, I just absolutely loved it. And one of the things that I loved watching all the projects come up on the Outlaw Year Lear were people because it's a design. It was a two color design. It really worked incredibly well with high contrast colors and people i think a lot of people pushed the boat out and because they were often forced to use yarns that they had existing in stash they were you know they possibly put combinations together they would have normally not done if they were able to go to the store or hq or skeins and purchase the the yarn at the time so they they threw things together so we saw i think there was definitely a classic black and white but there were things like um definitely like a i think a purple and an orange and a mm. Yeah, a, a green and a, um, a bright, like absinthe green and a dark purple. Sorry, my dog courier has arrived. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, so they did uh, things like that with the colours and it just it made the hat pop and you could actually see that incredible colour work as it was getting worked along. It was amazing. Mm. Yeah, it was really exciting to watch progress. And mm. some people um, dyed their yarn with food colour or, you know, to get the things they wanted or used a different yarn altogether. So. Yeah, it's really resourceful. Yeah, no, it's absolutely beautiful. I've gone and popped that link in the uh, comments for people if they haven't picked up Quarantarium before. Um, now, talk about, um, I mean, what's that beautiful shawl you're wearing? That's absolutely stunning. The, Tell everybody yeah, about it's, that. I think the only, one of the only things I have, which has, you can kind of see the sparkle in it. Um, so I do a lot of collaboration with designers. I'll do a lot of just the, all the technical work, get paid for it, and then they get all the credit, which is great. Um, the, so this is an Inverness shawl, which I designed with um, Kyle Kaneki. So you get, uh, so you have um, two balls of 100 gram four ply weight and you start um, with the little cast on and then it's kind of like your wingspan, but it's actually um, circular. So, oh. it, so it um, drapes like really, really well. Yeah, yeah, and it's a really great way too to show off if you've got any ombre yarns or stripey yarn. I mean, that, I mean, I love those stripes, and I love how you've gone and put the black through the center of that color panel because I think it's something that I know the Japanese use a lot with color, and I know Stephen um, West does a lot with color. Black is actually it's it's one of those things that works brilliantly well in bringing out other colors. Is it black or is it a dark indigo? This is actually so this this section here you change yeah. yarns at each section. Ah. So this whole section is a gradient sock yarn yep. from Lang, and this this um, glitter yarn is as well. It's more. Um, more of a not a space dye a um semi-solid with the glitter flex in so they're both singles yarns both i i picked them up on holiday in switzerland so yeah it's um really exciting this one and oh, my okay. version's called rings of uranus so <laughs> so what's the name of that pattern again inverness inverness so um kyle Kaneki and i um i was demonstrating at loch ness knit fest and he was teaching and then the um so we took photos and the pattern there so you'll see some really hideous photos of me there <laughs> and actually for people that don't know Carl, because he was interviewed by suzanne bryan two weeks Just ago a few weeks ago yeah yeah it was a fantastic interview so if you want to check out carl do go over and check out off the um off the cuff with suzanne bryan because she interviews him there and it was it's a really well worth inter um, interview to watch it's brilliant he's a wonderful guy i love Carl. oh yeah now the sweater that you've got on i i, I have to, i saw that um <laughs> a while ago i think it was still in progress last time i saw it was still, still sitting on the machine or was it yeah so this yeah. is um, completely finished now so it's had um so it's been washed and it's had um this is an ashford tekapo three ply yarn and i've dyed over dyed the um the blue to make it so what i did when i landed i knew i had two weeks and not much work to do because a lot of my classes i teach it would be cancelled and stuff so i was like oh, i should just knit a sweater for myself for winter and um, so I had in this old machine knitting magazine 
Yes, and just to emphasise, that wasn't it on a machine before everybody thinks, yes. oh my Lord, he's actually knit that by hand. <laughs> so it was, the panels were knit in a day. I don't know if you can, it's hard on my iPhone, but this yeah. was... Um, it's almost was, like the, the wave, isn't it? Yeah, it's a Japanese wave pattern, and that was in the magazine, and so you get um, just a little oh, chart there to oh. work from. So I'd actually put it on Instagram story as a question, like what shape of garment should I make? What colors should I put with it? And um, what details? Like, so I didn't have to do the work. I just let other people do the work and then I just did the knitting. So yeah, it was really cool. The ultimate in design delegation. So yeah. so, in two, so, you, so as you said, you knit those panels in a day. So where, so what, how does that work? What's the construction like? Is it a, you know, we, yeah, yeah. we're going to make so, it off. I'll just take it off because it's 20 degrees in here. Um, so it's, I was actually at the same time trying out some new shapes of um, just set and sleeve. So it's a mm -hmm. basic, um, I might just see if I can make myself bigger. No. Um, no, Are you I'm able not. to actually flip round into landscape? Um, I want to remember maybe. Um, it might be a disaster. <laughs> let's look. Let's, let's get the bobbin for the spinning wheel, and then pop it here. No, it doesn't want to do that. Now you're sideways. <laughs> oh well. Oh well, it was with the dry. Uh. Oh, I'll put it back. Yeah, so it's just a you know pretty much commercial commercial size yeah set and sleeve sweater. But I ended up um, hand seaming all the all the seams on that one rather than chucking them through the sewing machine. So yeah, that took yeah. a little bit longer to finish, but. But it's nice having like that. Um, the construction is perfect enough to go into a competition or exhibition. Yeah. So yeah. when you have time, oh. you can do that kind of thing. So Suzanne's come up with a question. She's wanting to know, can you recommend a good beginner knitting machine, please? Ah, cool. So um, actually, I'll talk a little bit about um, machines and how they work. So I have, um, I have a little section of a knitting machine here. And basically all the, I have to show it to you so you guys can see. So you have these needles and they have a hook. And it's kind of like a latch hook or a crochet hook. And then they slide up and down every single stitch you have. So if the front of your sweater had um, 100 stitches, you'd have 100 needles. And each one would be holding a stitch. And then you just would run a carriage across and as they move up and down, it um, knits the fabric for you. So you can actually have two of these. So one this way. So this would make a, all your plain um, stockinette fabric. If you have another one attached here, it'll make purl stitches on this side while you have knit stitches here. And then if you get the latest machinery, it actually has two above as well. So it's an X-bed machine. So the, um, the hooks that are above here will hold stitches while it's knitting below and then put it back. So that, that would be the latest technology in the machine. Um, so this um, is from a Bond sweater machine, which were popular in the 90s. And um, if you're an experienced machine knitter, you can get them to knit. If you're not, um, you'll have a real shit time. <laughs> yeah, we've got a bulky, we've got a couple of old bulky eights at, at work and we use them for um, just basically checking uh like quality control mm -hmm. so uh we just will run out a whole sort of sway the cro um, a cloth across a ball uh random balls just to check you know quality twist yeah. are, there, are there any faults and things like that yeah so and and they are certainly i mean because we don't do anything other than just straight blocks of cloth it's not really an issue but they are certain i mean it's like anything, I guess. It's you, once you've learned how to do it, um, it's just taking a little bit of time. And the actual knitting itself may not necessarily take long, but it's the setup yeah. and the planning and the process of what it is that you're wanting to do. Yeah. And then so, all the finishing as well takes. Yeah. Time. So, so the so, um, the next, you know, to answer the Suzanne's question, so the yeah. next step up machine would be your um, brother, 
um, Brother KX350 or your Singer LK150 or they're sold under Silver Reed as well. So they're a plastic based machine still, but they have a lot more um, usability. They use a lot of your hand knitting yarns. And so I've just made another sweater during quarantine, uh, which is nearly stitched up. And this is using um, Brooklyn Tweed Shelter. So it's another, a little bit larger sweater that has, um, you'll see some of the traveling twisted stitches that I put wow. in, in the front detail of that. So, um, so yeah, that's the type of thing you can do on that machine as well as, um, I have another swap somewhere. So I've been doing some entrelac on that as well. Really? On, on a machine? Yeah, and larger entrelac too. So. Oh, stop it. And entrelac with garter stitch buttonholes and yeah. And so that's that's easy mm -hmm. on a um, they're relatively affordable um, machines. So the the silver reed or the LK150 that are still available. Because I know that, that quite often people will pick up knitting machines at um, op shops or or they'll be given one and stuff. And I know, I mean, for us, like, for example, with our bulky eight, that's where we all often pick up spare parts from because yeah. they're not readily available. But I guess the downside with that is unless they come with manuals, but it's also parts too, isn't it? Because, you know, there are a lot of moving parts in those machines. Yeah. So all the, um, all the other machines I own were all from last century. Mm. pretty much i don't think i have anything made this century so that's for the standard gauge gauge machines like that i knit the japanese sweater on um yeah and then i was looking to see um through like i have over 50 machine knitting books as well so the newest one was printed in 1991 so it just goes to show yeah yeah even though they're yeah fantastic books you know the height of machine knitting was like in the late seventies and eighties. Yeah. And, you know, that's one of the problems that um, the machine knitting societies have is, you know, the, the gold standard is that like perfectly made, you know, seventies, eighties style sweater. Whereas I'm trying to push, you know, the boundaries of the machinery to mm -hmm. see where it will go. Yeah, so um, you'd fit right in at Design Spun. That's, <laughs> <laughs> that's our motto. <laughs> So it was really cool um, when um, Stephen B was in Auckland and sitting in one of the class I did with him. And most of the time I was making notes about, oh, how can I do that technique on the knitting machine? Mm. So, yeah, it's a really interesting time. And I also, too, what I loved is the sample that you held up before. Like, so, I mean, you showed the the Japanese wave-styled one in the Tekapo 3-ply, which is, I mean, the Tekapo yarns, uh, they have a finer weight yarn as well that I know a lot of machine knitters are very fond of, Ashford. But that um, the fact that you use Brooklyn Shelter, Brooklyn, Brooklyn Tweed Shelter, yeah. and it's, you know, I mean, that's a, that's a very popular hand knitting yarn to actually show that you are able to, I mean, that would have pushed the boundaries of the machine, I would have thought. I mean, that's a template. Yeah, most, most people that have machine knitted it have failed. Yeah. And, yeah, it's just... And it's woolen spun yarn as well. I would have thought that it would not take kindly to a machine yeah well actually the machines um are actually really gentle on the yarn they don't rub it like your fingers do hand knitting so you can mm. i've knit things three times you know just unraveling it and and the yarn still looks perfectly new one thing i do do with the shelter though is i get the yarn and i um add more twist on the spinning wheel and then i wrap it onto a cone and steam it and i use that for seaming so the yarn doesn't break when i'm doing my hand sewing right yeah so yeah that's the, the other thing the ashford tekapo three ply is really it's similar um grist to the um jamesons and smith jumper mm -hmm. weight two ply so i have a machine knit tea cozy done at jamesons and it's um the same texture and stuff yeah. you know but it's a lot easier to machine knit the ashford one the ashford tekapo so i just buy that on um one kilo cones and dye yeah what i need so which is really exciting so um during quarantine as well i've made over a hundred how well you can see these over a hundred swatches of wow different color blends so already you've, been, to make you've been very busy my friend very very busy i know yeah so i wanted um so the 
machines I use have a, um, I'm going to have to get some power soon for my phone, which will be fun. Um, so some of the um, tools that you have to use are often not included in new machines when you're given them that are often they're rusty. Some of the parts only last about five years before they need replacing. And, you know, if someone's had a machine in an attic for 20 years, it's, um, you know, it's not going to be great. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the hand manipulation, you use tools like these, and that takes just as long as hand knitting or longer. So that's something you have to take into account with what you do. Um, this is um, a tool that you can transfer up to 200 stitches at a time. You just link mm -hmm. them all together. Um, I'm going to get some power and yeah. um, you talk for a few minutes. Okay, no problem. Um, one of the other things that Kurt mentioned there before, like in terms of the Tegapo three ply, it's a really great yarn, and it's you know, and it's one of the things as well. I think it's it's a grippy yarn. Um, we manufacture that yarn, so I know that yarn very very well, and it's. Um, and it's a little bit like, it's a slightly finer version of our Southland Sport that I'm using here in the Rambler. And it's one of the things that I think um, I'm definitely seeing is a move towards more rustic um, tr yarns traditional to what, you know, I was used to when I grew up. And the neat thing about them is, is that they have this, um, I call it the Velcro effect, but they work wonderfully with colour work. They work, um, like particularly with machine knitting, you're, you're doing panels, or if you're hand knitting and you're doing any colour work and you're needing to steak, which can, you know, seem quite terrifying, but of course steaking is something, particularly if you're working on tubular machines, is, is quite par for the course. I mean, it's something that you would normally do. And these sorts of yarns, um, you know, work brilliantly at being able to, to do that for you. So I, I absolutely adore them. And the fact that, I mean, some people have said, oh, you know, they're a bit rougher or they're a bit scratchy. I don't, I mean, they're not as smooth as some of the more machine washable yarns that we have today. But the one thing that you do do is you do have a tendency to nearly always wear another layer underneath them. So whether that be a T-shirt or a fine seam or anything like that. And um, it's, as I mentioned the other day too, it's the wearability. So you're not going to get, um, there's nothing worse than spending hours and hours and hours um, of, you know, time working on a garment and then it just doesn't perform very well so now I'm, I'm very fond of those yarns now charles is asking here what was what kind of machine was the japanese sweater made on so that was made on a um um a brother standard gauge machine so brother um i have too many it's a 860 i think kh 860 machine so i um I only use a single bed machine. Like I take it back to being really simple and yeah. then I use that as, um, you know, you have to think really creatively. So rather than, you know, I, I've um, trained in using computerized, you know, Shima Seiki machines as well. And that's where you do everything on the computer and then you click a button and it comes out. So um, just to digress. So when I did my training with that, this is a little, um, do you remember Nokia phones? <laughs> So this is a little, um, like a lace knit, super fine, um, little cozy for Nokia. And did and so you do that on the machine? Yeah, this was, um, the machine knit it. I just did it on the computer and then clicked yep. the button, put it in the USB drive and the machine spits it out as many as you want. So, which is really exciting. So I use the um, very simple flatbed machine and everything gets, um, you have this little, hole punch thing that punches one hole at a time and you get this is a naked lady but you punch holes in these things and you feed that in and then depending on your machine settings that punch card programs it so i will um have a really good so this is um it's probably about 50 stitches cast on mm -hmm. and so you can knit um on the black so you can just by changing a dial on the machine goes from knitting thick to fine and then you can do some slip stitch if you can see the slip stitch patterns just by pushing a button and then some i think that's some tuck stitch oh no that's the slip stitch you can see behind there and then you can weave a thicker yarn through mm. and then Little. this is where it gets really nice um, beautiful lace amazing lace that you can knit wow and then the machine also does that's the exact same lace but done 
and a different technique that doesn't leave large holes so it gives you more texture yeah and then this is a tuck lace which is extremely fast um to knit up so beautiful yeah and um especially um my friends and my machine knitting friends in australia they use a lot of this tuck lace texture yeah and they'll use you know packer yarns um stainless steel yarns all sorts just making square panels and then you can cut them you can do whatever you like so it's um really exciting another thing i use a lot i'll just grab um it out of the box uh, is this little guy which is called a g carriage yeah i was just gonna say it's a little carriage yeah so so he plugs into the electricity and you know you punch a special punch card and he just goes along stitch by stitch cha -chong, cha -chong, cha -chong, cha -chong, and we'll do a pearl stitch for you when you want a pearl stitch oh um, that's how i do a lot of my um my rib work yeah so it does take longer but you can do i'll just grab a sweater um but this gansey was knit you can don't think yeah see. yeah definitely so all your traditional gansey motifs are all knit um using, by using that machine so it takes a few hours but to do each panel but you can work on other things like i'll spin some other yarn or whatever while that yeah. machine's running so charles has said he's got a silver reed is there anything he can do complicated on that yes <laughs> Yeah, so that the entrelac you can do on that really easily. Um, what I would suggest is go on to Blueprint, and um, there's only about five machine knitting videos on there. One is, um, I've got in the lady, but how to basically knit a very simple sweater. The other one is Suzanne um, Gragliumi, I think her name is, and she does a lot of hand manipulation techniques by machine. So, yeah, they can all be done. So another... Um, thing I use a lot for um, fashion production is called a knit leader. So just grab it. Um, so it's this thing here. And so what I do is I draw, um, I have training in um, pattern making and garden construction. Mm -hmm. that. So I draw the pattern exactly as I want. Although this one was actually, um, all the pattern making was done on a computer by an Auckland designer, Andrew Douglas. And then I just um, copied the design. I did all the grading and stuff as well. So um, you knit a swatch and you um, put the measurements of the swatch in here and select a little dial here. And as you knit, the little, I don't know if you can see it move. Oh, yeah. No, yeah. It moved down. Yeah. So the... Um, so it tells you as you're knitting, like when to do increases and decreases yeah. and that type of thing. So I could get, um, say, Southlander Sport would probably be the thickest yarn I could use on this machine and knit a sweater to this exact shape. Yeah. And then I could get your finest yarn and knit the exact same shape. Um, purely using this, like having to do no other calculations. Which is actually very similar to what Stephen was talking about, Stephen Bird yeah. was talking about in his class, is actually not looking at uh, the number of stitches, but taking shapes and actually knitting to those shapes to create your, your finished garment. So that, um, the dress on that knit leader is actually knit um, in lace and um, a cotton linen. And so you shouldn't be able to do this. And it's actually beyond that machine's capabilities. So I have a whole lot of post-it notes I've put across which have the actual measurements working towards. And um, this lace actually biases a lot as well. So I sent you a link um, oh, yes. for the actual garment, Lumai. And you can actually buy one if you want, and I'll knit it up for you if you have a few hundred dollars to spend. Um, but it was on... Um, at, in Sydney at um, the Pacific Runway Showcase. Um, so that's so was, Lumai, isn't it? Yeah. yeah so you can see the dress up. there. You have to have a really, um, be very confident in your body for that one. Mm. <laughs> I'm confident <laughs> in my body, darling, but I don't know how confident everyone will be to be in that. <laughs> yeah. Just throwing that out there. Yeah. Um, 
Now, let's have also talk about, because I do know that you are very active within Creative Fiber, and you, I know you love yeah. to spin and do I'm going to show you one more machine. Oh, go on, then. Go on. And while you're doing because, that, you get that, and I'm just going to let my dog in before he barks. Okay. Because not many people get to see the um, circular sock machine. So I've been after one oh, for about five years and finally got one two years ago. And it weighs a ton. Oh. This oh, I just think those are so, gosh, that one's from, that. she's a vintage piece. Yeah, yeah, it's really heavy. But yeah, so you you have your little tubes and knit on there. And then there's this attachment as well, which goes on top, which does your ribbing. Oops. So it's, a, um, and now I'm covered in grease. So I'll just wipe that off. But that's a, like, it's really simple, that machine. Mm. All it does is you turn a handle in it, yeah, I can knit through a hundred gram ball of sock yarn in less than 10 minutes. Wow. Easy. But then if you want to do, so I'll grab one of the most, um, this is Arno and Carlos's, um, one of their socks. So that I can do that in six hours on the circular sock machine. Wow. So that's, yeah, something cool you can do. Um, just a basic sock for myself. So opal yarn, just plain Jane sock. It was about 40 minutes from beginning to end. Um, Suzanne Bryan, who you interviewed, she has her undulant sock pattern, so I adapted oh, yeah. it for the machine. So how do you, okay, so how do you manage to do that on the machine in terms of the, so the you, short run? Um, um, the same as doing a heel. So all most sock machines can do a heel, so yeah. all you're really doing is knitting, it's just a little heel. And then another little heel next to it. <sighs> and so they just, you know, you, on this side, you can kind of see how they're a little bit bumpy because, mm. you know, these have hardly been worn because they're more a showpiece. But um, so you can do that. I hand, like, these are one of my favorite socks. So I hand spin a lot of yarns for socks. And these are, this is Romney, um, spun and dyed, and um, they last forever. Oh, uh, Rom, Rom, it's actually uh, Romney yarn is, uh, we use a lot of crossbred and Romney, uh, actually a lot of our Southlander is um, predominantly comes and well, Romney makes up a huge amount of that. And it just, I I love all these rustic New Zealand breeds. I just, Perindale's another one too, beautiful Sheen. Ashford, I know we use a lot of Corridale uh, with Ashford yarns. They just, they perform so, so well. It's, and I'm people really... often like we we're talking earlier about the scratch, but I use the um, the yeah. yeah unicorn fiber rinse, and I use the power scour and the fiber wash as well. But it just makes such a difference, and yeah, the sweaters last forever. Like I've just finished knitting um, this Ruffers hat, and so I used um, you guys spin it, but Bellevue mm. Wool Park. Oh yeah, gorgeous. Yeah. So it's merino, which hasn't been super washed. It's really nice to use, yeah. but like it's already like um, pilling yeah. quite bad. It hasn't even, yeah. So, that Bellevue, know, just because so, so, it's not readily available in New Zealand. So that Bellevue Park is, uh, it's very, very similar to the texture. Um, it's, I think it's around 18 micron. It's mm. pretty fine. And it's utterly beautiful, really buttery. And there's no treatment across it because they want to keep it as natural as possible. But as you said, I mean, it is one of those yarns that yeah. if you were working a garment on it or a blanket, it would be starting to pull at the bottom as you were working your way out the top. It's just, but it's so and beautiful. I've overdyed it. It was originally lime green. That's, That's no, why you probably didn't recognise it. No, no, it's just <laughs> kind of like that in the range. But there you go. No, it's a really beautiful yarn. Really beautiful yarn. So on the um, on the sock machine as well, you can. This is a little crazy sample I've done, but you can do um, little tuck stitch texture like this, just by putting yarn, putting needles in or out of work, and then you can do by pick, um, knitting and then picking up like a standard square mm -hmm. heel flap as well. And then this is your little like eye of partridge um, slip stitch. Um, I think that's a square heel as well. I can't remember since I did this. And then this is your, um, you know, your nicer fitting triangular heel. So when I first bought my machine, oh, and that's some um, Intagia little ready for some Argyles as well. On the hem. So when I first bought my machine, I thought I could only do short row heels. 
it was only um, sometime last year I realized that actually you can do all of this with it. So Now, um, Christina has asked, what does a unicorn fiber rinse do? So it's like um, conditioner for your hair, but mm. for, um, so it just makes the garment feel a lot softer mm. and reduces a little bit of the prickle. So in Auckland, we're quite humid. So the, the prickle can be exaggerated from that. But it's, um, yeah. So one thing, I, I do a lot of dyeing, washing, and then I'll dry things in the oven. So, because I need stuff in the same day or, in, you know, within an hour. So I can, from fleece to spinning the yarn, dyeing, and knitting a sock on the machine, I can get a sock, for, one sock finished in a day. So by drying stuff in the oven. But if you're using the um, fiber rinse, you don't want to dry it in the oven because it will no. discolor. But... No. So Sylvia has asked, what color did you use to over dye the hat? Now remember, Sylvia, the hat was lime green. So yeah, um, lime green. Here I'll get my little because I make notes for everything. Because like the Japanese sweater, I ran out of yarn and had to re dye some, which is always interesting when you yeah um, need to match it. Yeah, but it matches perfectly fine. Um, so it was over dyed with navy blue, blue, and teal. And that's in, I use the Ashford um, wool dyes now. Mm. Um, so creative fiber, let's talk about creative fiber because obviously you have your love, your love of spinning and you're very involved with the Auckland chapter up there. And um, like so many of us, I know Margaret's in chat at the minute and uh, I had to uh, defer Knit August Nights for next year and I know that Woolfest um, is in the same boat and it's just because you've got the new venue now out at the Cumu Showgrounds which mm. I think rocks I love it out there such a great venue um, but um, you've been really busy I know Margaret they're very very busy setting up some social media so talk us through that yeah so uh, what can I say so yeah people know about Woolfest it's about 70, 70 plus traders I think um, so that's run by Creative Fibre in Auckland. For people that don't know about Creative Fibre, we're really lucky in New Zealand to have a national spinners, weavers and wool craft society. So I've been a member of them since um, 2015, I think I joined in order to learn to spin. And then I've been heavily involved, you know, writing articles for them, um, teaching and um, doing things in Auckland there. So since Woolfest hasn't been able to go ahead, there's been an online group set up which you can join and all the traders that weren't able to trade um, have are showing their stock there and as part of the hand weavers guild where i'll be teaching from the end of this month as long as we go down to alert level two um, we'll be posting the classes that are available there as well so um, what's really important i know a lot of people actually won't be buying anything from the page is actually to go through and hunt through and see what people have if you like something to share it share it with your friends share it on, around facebook and stuff so word gets out otherwise stuff just falls you know within that page but it's really important that we really you know support all our trade even though you know they're not buying from skeins but they're yeah they might be you might be purchasing indirectly from skeins but Everything we do supports um, our whole community together. Well, the thing I love about um, Woolfest is that it is a gathering, um, like a lot of them, it's a gathering of, of the local artisans that we have in this country. And the beautiful thing about the Auckland event is because it is in Auckland and the central nature of it, it does um, pull together a huge diverseness that much more than what I would pull together for for example, with Knit August Nights. I mean, for me, I can only pull together about 20 traders. But there, you know, as you said, it's around 70. And everything, like I, last year, I was next to Palliser Ridge. And they, uh, you know, they it's a farm. They have make get their own yarn produced. They produce, uh, as well as yarn, they produced um, beautiful jumpers and sweaters. And, and being able to actually see uh, that sort of farm to yarn story and actually talk to these incredible people that do this, it just makes, uh, I mean, it just shows you the depth that we have in the local community. Um, and, you know, there was those guys, you've got small, you know, small dyes, you've got people that, you know, just do look after hand um, spinning, or you've got people that look after weaving. There's so many different elements there and I just think it's such you know it's such a valuable resource because as yarn crafters a lot of us will start with one thing but it's events yeah. like that that will show us 
interest in other things you know I mean I I was always a knitter in fact I my very first thing is crochet I actually started to crochet before I could knit um but you know, I, I fell into hand spinning. I mean, hand spinning, now there's a vortex you could go down, isn't there? <laughs> Absolutely. It's, oh, yeah. So there's, it's just that inspiration. It's it's um, it, it's an energy. And I think, yeah, you're right. It's really important to, to support as much as we can those local mm -hmm. uh, local artisans. And what's really special about Woolfest, like it's the largest, one of the largest events. Yeah. And it's free and it's completely volunteer run by people within our community. So it's so different to like, when I taught at Loch Ness, that's run by an events company and none of the events management staff um, are knitters. And yeah. it's such a different experience, even though like the directors, you know, Crystal Safar, you know, she's absolutely amazing designer and, you know, amazing people involved, but having, you know, your people involved the whole way, even though it's, you know, it's really hard to put a thing like that together. It's a really amazing, thing to be involved with so yeah margaret has put up the link to the group in the um chat so thank you so much for doing that margaret that's brilliant Yay. so do you know do definitely go and do that because it is it is really important that you pull those in there and, and support and see who's there and see what they're doing um and just ever so briefly we'll talk about um you are actually working on the master of knitting program at the moment yeah so, so how's that fun. going for you <laughs> So yeah, you get locked in at home and you know, you're able to work a lot more on your swatches, but they've actually put a hold on anyone posting because it boxes get posted all around the States to three people to be adjudicated. So there's actually a hold on that at the moment. So I'm spending a lot of my time focusing, I'm at the tail end of my certificate in technical editing, so which I can do all online. So I've been working on that um, at the moment and working on um, developing new classes for the Hand Weavers Guild, which are coming up. The f very first one starts at the end of this month in um, weaving. So it's a three-day weaving weekend. So from working from nothing all the way to planning um, your own project. And, oh, is my phone going to die again? Oh, wow. Well. Um, planning your own project. And then I'm teaching spinning um, and then two other weaving classes. One on rigid head of looms using Southlander Sport, and but being really creative, more salary techniques and that type of thing. So um, that's all coming up between now and um, the end of August if you're based in Auckland, although some people are actually travelling up for those classes. Yeah, and I'm just going to pop the two links that you sent me up. Fabulous. Well. So what's become apparent as well with um, the COVID situation is people, um, beginning of the year, were like, cool, these classes are coming up. You know, I'm really excited to do it all of a sudden they have no income to do those classes. Mm. So what I quickly set up last weekend, two days ago, um, though the scholarship fund is still yet to be approved, but I've set up a GoFundMe page, or no, it's not GoFundMe, it's Give a Little page. And we're just collecting a little bit of money so that we can put that towards if someone really can't do a class, um, it'll help pay half of their fees and it'll help pay create a fiber membership for them. And if they need supplies like um, yarn or equipment, We'll try and help out where we can for that. So um, hopefully you would have put the link up. And I have. I've popped I've pop those links up for everybody. So, so I know you haven't been able to buy takeaway coffee for a while. And you haven't been able to buy fish and chips. So, you know, $5, $10, it all makes a massive difference. So I think our classes range, you know, about $60 class. So $30 pays for half of one person's class. So it makes it, it's going to make a massive difference to some people. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they're going to contribute to our collective community and, give back as well. So it's, yeah, it's something, you know, exciting we can do. And we're already, like, I mean, I've certainly seen a huge switch back to um, slow everything. So, you know, it's um, craft, handcrafts, whether it be sewing or knitting or crochet or weaving, uh, cooking. I mean, let's face it, you know, the, the, what was it, toilet paper, flour and yeast were the, <laughs> the hot commodities at the yeah. beginning of lockdown. So it, we are, we're all actually looking inwards and to those sorts of things. And I think uh, being able to actually help out, particularly with a class like that, is a really great idea for yeah, someone. Yeah, it's exciting. Mm. Yeah, it's interesting being someone who has a 10-year-old sourdough starter and then people are like, <laughs> just starting out now. Whereas, you know, I've, you know, I was bored of, sick of the taste of sourdough bread and I think about week two. <laughs> <laughs> I actually had a sourdough starter for years, and it was uh, it was called Myrtle after my grandmother, and which upset my mother greatly because, of course, if you've never done a sourdough starter, it can be 
can be a bit of a hideous looking beast that lives on your bench, but it is a, a really fun thing to do. Well, it has been an absolute, absolute delight. I just um, have a sample that um, I might send a pattern to Charles, and it's a wingspan um, that you can knit on the machine. Ooh! So you start out um, just doing short rows, actually, and then it creates a curve bigger and bigger and bigger. And this is just one ball of sock yarn, just done on a very basic machine. Yeah. And so you can do that with, you know, your wow. perfect thing to show off. And it starts to get into your, because it just has a, you know, stocking stitch rolled edge to finish it. You know, it starts to get into your, you know, the three-dimensional textures that you can start to do on a machine. So, yeah, and also, yeah. it's the sort of thing that, you know, you, you allow the yarn to really speak. So that's... Absolutely. Um, yeah. yeah. It'll soon tell you if it doesn't want to be knit. <laughs> yeah so if you if you love seaming um this is a feral like a little baby one but so that's the Anna and Carlos sock design just done yeah as a feral yoke so you can knit a feral you know yoke sweater on a flatbed a simple flatbed machine so it's just a little bit of imagination um just a rectangle you can um, put a cowl together, and that's goldfish. Wow. Oh! Two, two sock yarns. Wow, that's yeah. incredible. Oh, okay. this has been an absolute joy. Yeah. So the, um, I'll, I'll show you one more sample. Okay, go on. We love show and tell. Yeah, yeah. So this is, I think some people have seen this before, but so this is a beautiful cashmere yarn, and this is done with the garter carriage, so it's a bit slow. But this is a yoke sweater as well, and... Um, the yarn is really pushing the boundaries of the machine as well. It's um, a Chinese, um, one of the best yarn companies in Shanghai, but their yarns are a lot denser than we spin in New Zealand, and so the machines don't like them as much. But, like, when I was starting this, I think there were nine samples just made it straight to the floor before I could get, you know, this far, and I'm going to run out of yarn, so that's why I'm going to pull it apart and weave it. But just goes to show, you know, it's... Um, you can oh, knit quickly, yeah. but yeah. you have to learn how to fix mistakes or start again yeah. quickly yeah. as well. And you yeah. obviously have to have the patience of Job to be able to do it too, because as you said... Resilience, all... not patience. <laughs> <laughs> resilience, there you go. So this is my last, um, you know, resilience project, again in the Ashford Tekapo. Um, but I'm knitting a little Hansel. Oh, beautiful. Yeah, as long as I am... Um, don't lose my stitches there with my little higher, higher end stopper. So yeah, I dyed the yarns, these colors here. And so this is really good zoom meeting knitting until you get to the lace edging. And now I realize why some people swapped out the lace edging for I cord or for a more simpler, <laughs> but you know, we just put in lots of um, lifelines occasionally. So oh, yeah, that's nearly yeah. done, which yeah. is exciting. Oh. Oh, well, it's been an absolute joy to catch up with you. Thank you so much. And thank you, um, everyone, for sticking with us while we were getting through all our this, the fine. I have my favourite sweaters on the um, woolly board as well. <laughs> oh, there you go. And the, and, the, and the phone has worked beautifully. So I'm so pleased we were going to do that. It's so good to show everyone those samples. So thank you very much to Kurt. Make sure you check out those links, particularly the Give a Little page for that fund. Uh, I think that's a really, really fantastic idea for those classes. I will be back here again tomorrow. Um, I have no idea what I'm going to talk about, but I'm sure I'll make something <laughs> up between now and then. Yeah. But in the meantime, uh, have a great day. Thank you to you, Kurt. And I will see everybody same time, same place here tomorrow on the Quarantine Diaries. Bye. Ciao.